Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Really excited today to have an Imagineering episode. We have someone who worked for Walt Disney Imagineering. He is now designing virtual reality mini golf courses for a really wonderful VR game called Walkabout Mini Golf. The company is Mighty Coconut. I want to welcome Don Carson to Trending in Education. Don, welcome to Trending in Ed. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. I really love this game. My wife got me an Oculus Quest uh, about a year and a half ago. And as a skeptical Gen Xer who's interested in the future and likes the concept of virtual reality, I, I was open to it. And I found some games I liked, but I did not find a game that I loved until I discovered Walkabout Mini Golf. We're going to be talking about how VR might relate to learning. We're going to get you some of your take as someone who's been in emerging technology and new media and how you design some of this stuff. But before we do any of that, we always like to get to know our guests, how you got to this point in your professional life. You have a really interesting story. So I'd love it if you could share some of that with our listeners. You bet. Well, I'm currently the senior art director at Walkabout Mini Golf. And just like you, I got the VR headset during COVID and spent some really quality time with colleagues in the theme park business playing mini golf. And we just really, really quickly realized that there was a real similarity between the work that we do in theme parks and then this, the work that we are, are doing for Walkabout. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote them a fan letter and was invited to speak to their team. And then at the end of it, I said, you know, I wonder if you guys ever need any talent. I'm around, got the job. So my origin story really is I was that kid that drew all the time. And as I became a high school kid and a college kid, just the idea of being able to draw for a living was something I'd like to do. I went to college and was an illustration major because I thought, well, here's a potential career where I could draw and make a living. And then once I graduated, I went into the world and realized I really didn't like doing illustrations for commercial work. But my grandparents lived near Disneyland and we used to go to Disneyland Austin. And I loved Disney, especially Disneyland, and found out that there was this company, Walt Disney Imagineering. And then that became sort of my laser focus for the place that I wanted to work. And I think really the main reason in hindsight that I wanted it was I had a love for Disneyland, but I think I ultimately loved the idea of being able to design places that took people physically through an environment. Mm -hmm. And all those lessons I learned in illustration as far as how to communicate a story and how to draw a viewer into an image through composition, perspective, value, mm -hmm. color choices, worked also perfectly for the theme park business. I ended up being the art director for the Living History Center, which did the Northern California and Southern California Renaissance Pleasure Fairs. Mm -hmm. So I got this sort of illustration, environment design background. And then in the late 80s, I was hired by Walt Disney Imagineering, and I worked there through the mid 90s as a show designer working on projects like Splash Mountain, Toontown, Blizzard Beach. And, and since then, through freelance in the last you know, 37 years or so, I have been working as a freelancer designing theme parks for them and for Universal. But when the game Mist came out in the mid-90s, I thought it was really obvious that they had basically created a theme park on your screen that you could spend 40 hours exploring and reading books and, and yeah. solving puzzles. So I went back to Disney and said, hey, guys, look at this. There's this wonderful technology that's doing the same thing we're doing, but they're doing it on the screen. And there was a real pushback because really we work in concrete and cement and we make physical places and there's rides. So I started looking to the video game world as an opportunity to potentially use the skills I gained through Disney to these virtual computer-based CD-ROM games. Yep. And I found that the video game world was just as pushbacky about doing these projects. They didn't understand why Myst was popular. Mm. You know, what do you shoot at? What's the achievement points? What do mm. you do? So I've bounced back and forth for years working for video game companies and for the theme park business. And then for seven years, I worked for Phil Hedema's company, the Hedema Group, designing for Universal and for other various projects. Uh, working with some major IPs, DreamWorks being one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the while, always looking for that tool that did the best job possible of communicating my design, which had traditionally had been illustrative. I would do drawing of the thing we were building. Mm -hmm. I was starting to use 3D more and more. And when VR started coming into it, I thought, well, there's no reason we can't ride this ride before we build this ride. Mm. Know what works, know what the sight lines are, what it's like to be in the space, mm. what's it like to exit 
if there's a fire, you know, all those things. And so I've started becoming an evangelist for new mediums, VR being one of them. And strangely enough, despite the fact that 20 years had passed or more, they were still very, you know, like, well, we're architecture people and we don't, ah, uh, these, these are just sort of fleeting technologies that will go away. Mm. And when Walkabout came around, it seemed like finally I could sort of walk the walk and talk the talk. I could basically do what I think Walkabout does really well, which is we happen to play miniature golf here, but that's not necessarily the main reason it's been created. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is about placemaking. And a lot of it is also about connecting with people. Mm -hmm. The multiplayer experience is, is a fabulous way in which to stay connected to people all over the world. And in fact, a lot of the compliments that the product gets are people saying, you know, I reconnected with my dad, mm -hmm. you know, or my brother who lives 600 miles away. We don't ever get to talk, but every week we go and play miniature golf together. Mm -hmm. It isn't just the miniature golf. It's the where you're doing it and who you're doing it with. Yeah. Yeah. That sense of place is the thing that I really got from this VR mini golf game, which I think we all start to chuckle when we talk about it. But you know, conceptually, I understood for a while VR will take me to a different place. I remember, you know, playing a, with Second Life back in the day and being kind of like, eh, all right, you know, okay. And then that's going to get better. But I hadn't really experienced something that was meaningfully different. And what's interesting about it, and we're, we're going to get into learning and some of those ramifications in a bit, but what was interesting about it to me is that it's not as HD. It's low poly is the term that's used. So it's a little more impressionistic. It's a little more abstract. And it reminds me even a little bit of the uncanny valley, which I talk about a lot, which is the idea that when non-human agents start to get more human-like, but not quite there, they get creepy. And I feel like this space feels very otherworldly and safe and fun. And you're playing mini golf. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, absolutely. What's interesting is that the reason that's low poly is because of the limitation of the technology. Since we're optimized to work on even the Quest One, you basically have the computing power of a phone attached to your face. So there's, there's real limitations, especially when it's rendering twice, one for each eye, and then, what, 90 frames a second. Mm -hmm. So we really embrace, we call it kind of the Lego set aesthetic or Playmobil aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But by holding on to those limitations, it allows us to push off of them. And I think that where we do a really good job is Craig, who is our sort of unity artistic shader wizard, is able to make incredibly atmospheric choices with this arguably very simplistic design. Mm -hmm. Even our most recent release, which is uh, Atlantis, if you really scrutinize the rocks and the sea life and the ruins, it's really low poly. And yet there's a sense of atmosphere and mood and water and bubbles. It's this dedication to placemaking. And like I said, that happens to include miniature golf. Yeah. And uh, another feature, I, I promise if you're itching for us to talk about learning, it's coming. But another okay. feature that I think is also great is the ability to fly around the course, which is really dreamlike and exploratory and immersive. So kudos to you, Don, and to everyone at Mighty Coconut who has done really wonderful work. The name of that game is Walkabout Mini Golf. That all being said, I'd love to get more of your perspective on what we could learn, what we should think about when we're trying to design learning experiences or we're thinking about the future of learning or thinking about what's going on in education. You're like an outside speaker for the podcast, and I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective because I've always been struck by how much you can learn by going to an adjacency. And I think there's a ton that can be learned from theme parks and VR and game design. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on this. Just to briefly go back to Walkabout in relationship to this, Lucas Martel, who's the creator and the builder of this product and my boss, the company is made up of mostly movie makers, people who've made film as opposed to game developers. Mm. And then some a smaggering of sort of theme park people. And our goal is to create places, certainly. And then what I hope I bring to the party is that we're physical beings 
And when we get up in the morning and we swing our legs over the bed and we plant, we do that with the belief that the floor is going to meet our feet. We don't worry so much about the things like gravity going away or any of that stuff. So built into us is a way in which we relate to the physical world. And what is unique about VR is we can play with that mm. and we can create environments. You go, oh, I've never been under the sea to the ruins of Atlantis, but I have expectations. Mm. And so our job is to initially meet those expectations and then we can playfully exceed them. Mm. And one of the ways we do that is we sprinkle around inside the environments. We call it story. Disney mm -hmm. calls it story with a capital S. It's not a linear once upon a time kind of story. It's much more a, I came upon a vignette or a moment where some activity was being done. And then I get to deduce almost like a detective Mm -hmm. Who was here? What were they doing? And what did I catch them doing? There's also an opportunity for humor. In the example of our El Dorado course, we're playfully creating a lost city, but we're also creating a lost city that is probably abandoned because of genocide. So how do you playfully mix in a miniature golf park in there without making some reference to the history of the space, without mm -hmm. disrespecting it? And so the one thing we added, and it's just a humorous little moment, is we have the skeleton of a conquistador, which has been crushed by a piece of masonry, but he's reaching out for this gold mask that's just outside of his reach. Mm. And some people just play on by it and don't really notice it. But the people that do run across it, they get to be the first person to discover the joke and then share it with other people. Yeah. So, hey, guys, you've looked over here. There's this case or skeleton. He didn't get the gold. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the irony was they were there. They were there to get the gold and he didn't get the gold. Yeah. And we also hid a big cache of gold up in the mountains, too, that if you go flying, you can eventually find. And so every opportunity of all the courses we're doing, we sort of pepper it with these little story elements that allow you to, in a very Disneyland way, create your own day create mm -hmm. your own spirits, make your own narrative. And I believe there's a huge perspective in both education and also in museum science to deliver information in a way that allows you to discover it and allow you to be a part of it. The other thing that we're discovering too is that I think our brains in memory, we can intellectualize that that thing didn't really physically happen. That interaction I had playing golf at the bottom of the ocean with my best friend didn't physically happen, but it's stored in the same part of our brain mm. that when we visited, you know, in Hawaii, virtual miniature golf can't compete with Hawaii. But our memories are still that we had this bonding experience. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that there's an opportunity in VR to be able to transport people to historic events, fictional events, information, and impart it in such a way, especially if that experience is shared that is stored in that part of our memory that allows us to relate to it in a way that just words on a page or dates in a history book. When I left high school, I became really upset when I found out that history was actually interesting. <laughs> but somehow high school had made history the most deadly, boring thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I became an adult that I realized this is fascinating stuff. And although VR isn't the necessarily end goal for telling history, being able to place someone, whether it's in the plane of a bomber flying to bomb Berlin or finding out what it's like to travel the South in a bus while being black, right. all those things are things that are available now in VR that change you a little bit mm -hmm. by having had that experience. And I think going back to our conversation about the low polyness, the stylizedness of it, we're really willing to forgive the visuals unless they're attempting to be ultra realistic. And then immediately our brain looks for that looks wrong. That's mm -hmm. uncanny. Mm -hmm. There is an uncanny valley for architecture and placemaking, not just people faces. Yeah. And I think we get away with kind of avoiding that uncanniness by embracing playfulness and limitations with how many polys we have to work with. Yeah. And then if we extend this forward and we start thinking about where these technologies are, are going to head and how that might influence learning, I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective on that, both about designing physical spaces and designing virtual spaces. And then that leads me to wonder where you're thinking augmented reality will come in, which is kind of somewhere in between the two. 
any high level thoughts, particularly for folks who might care about learning, but also just as someone who's immersed in the field, I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective on where you see this stuff heading, because it does feel like we're still, we're at an interesting inflection point and this technology is starting to accelerate. Yes, it certainly is. And certainly AI is terrifyingly fast developing. And I think there's a real place for that as well. Mm -hmm. The secret of Ken Burns' documentaries has been that he allows you to ask the question, what would it have been like if I was there? You know, through letters and through people's memoirs and relationships and back and forth between events and how it was affecting people. When themed environments or any environment design is done, it puts our shoes into that situation where we can ask ourselves, if I was in this situation, what would it be like? What does it feel like to be in here? Would I be afraid? Would I be excited? Do I have God view? Am I looking down on this happening and looking at it sort of as a map or am I in it? And as world designers or place designers, whether you're an architect, you're a theme park designer, or an, even an illustrator, you're orchestrating how the events unfold and how you relate to it. One example being that cathedrals often start with a small room that you enter first, sort of a foyer, that then opens out to this vast sort of heart-stopping space, all the stained glass and everything. That's not by accident. Mm. It's been orchestrated to elicit that response of I'm in a dark space and I open into a large space. That's just one of many, many other tools that artists could use to help them better relate to what they're experiencing and being able to utilize those same principles, but telling the story of a Civil War battlefield or what it was like to be Anne Frank. Any topic you would want some way for your audience to relate to, I think there's a, a huge opportunity in it. Mm -hmm. I think one of our biggest struggles we have right now is standardization. There's no YouTube link that you click and then you're, you're presented with the content. And VR really needs to have that, hey, check this out. They press it, put their headset on, and they're there. Mm -hmm. The same thing for uh, academic world. You know, How do you tell all these diverse stories in a way that uses the same technology and has the same button? to mm -hmm. get you, whether it's produced by the university or it's produced by outside sources. I think our biggest challenge right now is that we, we aren't used to using this technology for storytelling. And I think in these early, early days, humans really suck at prediction as to how these things will or will not work. Our gut reaction when it's that new is to kind of push it away. Like, yeah. well, I know how to use a pencil. Why would I use a mouse? Right. Uh, was probably the, the battle cry of the late 90s. And now it's like, well, I know how to use the mouse, but I don't know how to build things with my hands in VR. Right. We're going to have to wait for everyone to catch up, including a younger generation that is not as terrified of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. But in our way, we think of walkabout as at the very least something we can point to and say, look what's possible. Now apply that to Ramses II. Yeah, absolutely. The other use case I've heard about is you know, in response to Zoom fatigue and the fact that we're not always in the same place, but we want to have a shared work experience. We want to have the equivalent of like an outing together. Can you talk a little bit about where you see that heading? Do you imagine in the future that workplaces will be equipped with ways for us to connect through virtual spaces? Yeah, I think that's going to be inevitable eventually. I think one of the surprising things that we've discovered with Walkabout and a lot of compliments that we've gotten from various people is that they have their corporate meetings there or their corporate away you know, field trip they have it while playing miniature golf. We've had companies, including Cyan, who we work with on the MIST course, they knew our product because they were actually meeting up in there to have informal meetings. We've also had people who do job interviews in walkabout because there's something disarming about the fact that you're just, oh, we're just having a simple ministry right. golf game, easy. But also the timing where someone is taking a putter and having to concentrate for a moment while someone else is talking and then they get to switch roles. Mm. You get to know someone really well from that interaction in a way that just a Zoom conversation doesn't. In fact, we were just talking about this recently at work. There are some VR groups that are replicating what we call the ballroom conference room at a convention where everything looks as stark and lifeless as they do in the real world. A part of that is, I think, we're corporate and we're important and we have to be trendy and marvelous. And I think there's a tremendous room for that. 
I think you see that also in the Quest home spaces that if you own a Quest, when you enter in that space, they offer you mm. these very, very pretty environments to stand in. But one of the things they don't necessarily do is imbue them with humanity, mm -hmm. imbue them with a little messiness. You know, someone didn't finish cleaning the dishes over there in the corner and someone mm -hmm. didn't push all the chairs together. I think it's finding a way to embed humanity into the environments that we meet in. Yes, there's room for the cold conference room, but is there a way for us to, to experience those meetings on a desert island that happens to have Mai Tais there, even though we can't drink them? They're the context for human interaction and connection. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think mm. the other thing, too, is what is the environment where creativity happens? Mm. Mm -hmm. Do we have that around a campfire? Do we go to a big holodeck that has a gridded screen that then the world manifests around us? Mm. All those tools are available to us. I think we just need to try a lot of them out to see what feels like the best fit for our human interaction, whether it's with your dad or it's with your boss. Mm. Uh, what's the best place for us to have that connection? There you go. Zoom fatigue, a remedy is on the horizon. You mentioned artificial intelligence. Just about every episode, I wound up mentioning chat GPT. We also have a virtual co-host, Nancy, who's not on today, but AI is impinging on our understanding of the world around us. And it's very much changing how people think about jobs and the future of work. Before we get into the AI thing, just the nature of the work itself I find fascinating and it does seem like the type of work that you and you're not alone you're doing this with a collaborative team can you describe the types of work the the types of people who really gravitate to this type of work and thrive in these types of environments and then maybe get into a little more about where you see the job prospects and career growth happening around this type of work well when i left disney in the mid 90s I ended up forcing this idea of a remote worker and I've been doing it for 27 years at a time where when I would do an illustration, I had to factor in the FedEx shipping time for the physical artwork to get to those people. Mm. The virtual working has sort of caught up with me. Now it's kind of common day thanks to COVID and our having to be at home and work from there. Walkabout is mostly a virtual company, although there's a core of the company that's in Austin, Texas and a core of our tech team that are in Boise, we have employees in New York, up in Beaverton and Oregon, and we also have an employee in Australia. And all of our meetings are virtual. Often we meet either in the game itself, we all sit on the raft and we have our meeting while we go around the Welcome Island raft or in the pirate ship, or we meet using uh, Horizon Workrooms. Really, I've never met physically some of the people that I've worked the last year and a half with. So there is a wonderful aspect to physically being there, but we've discovered there's a real way for us to bond and be a team, despite the fact we've never actually physically met. Mm -hmm. So I think that those barriers are dropping and our willingness to work that way is growing. I do think we're all feeling sort of Zoom fatigue as far as the rigmarole of having to sit in a box with post it stamp pictures of everybody, yeah. half of who are not willing to turn their camera on. But that doesn't seem to happen in VR where we were all present, we actually get to with facial tracking, see twitching and yawning and hand gestures. And that's only going to get better, I think. As far as our work process, I'm sort of on the front end of a lot of the concepts for these new courses we're working on. And I work with Lucas and Henning, who are sort of founding members of the company. And we meet in a program called Gravity Sketch, where we go from so really scribbling in space and we're all three of us are in the space despite our physical location. Yeah. And then we just start refining and refining and refining that virtual model, bringing in other team members to experience it with us. Mm -hmm. And then it hits a point where then that model gets handed to individuals over the project's life cycle mm -hmm. and they add to it, add to it, add to it. While we play test it, probably every week, one or twice, we play test some project that's in development. We're now play testing stuff that probably won't come out until the end of the year, mm -hmm. but in their most rudimentary form. But I think the advantage is we're doing it together. We can see each other's avatars. We can point things out. We can grab things and we can edit them on the fly. Creates a relationship that we couldn't. Without the headset, even if we were physically together, we couldn't have that same experience. Right, right. And then 
what type of roles do you envision? You know, because I'm thinking Trinity is something people talk about a lot, for example. And, you know, if someone's, say, in learning and they want to get out ahead of a trend and, you know, gaming's going to be ahead of learning, generally speaking, which is why I like to keep an eye on what's happening over there. But like, are there places where if folks were looking ahead and saying like, okay, in terms of getting into this field or being relevant as more VR opportunities come online, do you have any advice or suggestions for folks? Number one is to be open-minded. I think one of the scary things when it comes to learning new tools is that we believe that we have to immediately become experts in them. And especially when you're talking about 3D design, customarily, these tools like Maya or 3D Max or even Blender have an incredibly steep learning curve. And you can feel demoralized really, really quickly when you're not learning it. These virtual building tools are getting easier and easier and more intuitive. So even someone without an artistic background can start to mass together the pieces that they need to at least have a conversation about placemaking. Mm -hmm. Also a willingness, if the tool offers you 1500 abilities, but you only need to know three, learn the three. Yeah. Become always curious and familiar with the understanding that these tools, even if they're alien to you, are a potential gateway to communicate the ideas that you've had all along. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing I'm doing today with these virtual tools that I wasn't doing in the late 80s doing physical theme parks. It's still an idea communicating that design to other people who will implement it. But also a willingness to not necessarily be the person who has to implement all of it. Mm -hmm. especially with the addition of AI, I think more and more, even this year, we're going to see a lot more worlds created through prompts. Right. You ultimately need that imagination to decide what they're asking for and then refining it through continued prompt writing. Right. I do foresee that maybe even by the end of this year, stepping into an empty void in VR and then start talking about the environment and having it manifest around you is not impossible to imagine. That sounds amazing. So you're basically saying the holodeck is not too far away. It feels like that. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's a huge amount of uncanny valley that's happening in AI art generation right now. So we're sort of starstruck by the quality of the imagery. We yeah. can't believe that it's so amazingly photoreal. Hmm. Uh, but when we start scrutinizing and we go, how many fingers does it yeah. have? It almost yeah. feels intentionally creepy, but... It, yeah. I imagine it's just more that's the uncanny valley. Too. Like it's just something that is randomly different that AI just extrapolated to. And for us, we're like, don't ever do yeah. that. You know? Too many fingers, too many teeth. <laughs> that was really the place I was curious about. I've been struck by how generative AI is really breaking through. And then what you're describing is fascinating in that no human will have had to have built the whole thing prior to the prompt. And then I did see the term, which I thought was slightly funny, prompt crafting like as that. the skill. And then immediately joker that I am, I thought it's almost like doing macrame on demand. You're, you're prompt crafting, but the importance is crafting the right terms and en engaging with the other, like really collaborating and engaging in a meaningful way where you're using AI to get more you're someone who thinks about the future a lot. You've broken new ground in some of the things that you've done. What are your thoughts right now? It's been almost like a watershed year on the AI front, and I'd love to get some of your perspective on this. Well, it was interesting because I remember when the game Mist came out in the mid-90s. If you reflect on it, that story is about people who, through writing in a book, can manifest a world. Mm. And so full circle, here I am, a fan of Mist then Mighty Coconut actually partnered with the Cyan yeah. creators of it to create a miniature golf park based upon this yeah. virtual world where words created places. Mm. And that seemed impossible by the 90s, but it seems rather obvious that that's what we're going to be experiencing in the not-too-distant future. Mm -hmm. uh, as an artist, there's a very loud majority of other artists who are understandably terrified of the idea that they'll never work again because it's so easy to create beautiful imagery. Mm -hmm. But I have a small group of artists who, who are asking the question, yeah, but how are artists going to use it? Yeah. You know, not just it's going to take my job away. Well, what does it allow me as an artist to do? Mm -hmm. I have a, a very good friend, Mark Page, who is a fellow ex-imagineer, 
brilliant illustrator can draw anything under the sun, but inside of him, he has vast sort of Donatopia scaled universes that AI is allowing him to craft windows into this world. And so although you're looking at maybe mid-journey output, you cannot fail to see his fingerprint on mm -hmm. everything as he's refining and refining and refining this very, very deep, rich, culturally diverse, robotic, steampunky parallel universe that's come from his imagination and his minions rather than being a studio of artists, happens to be a relationship with AI. Mm -hmm. And I think to quell sort of my frustrated artist friends, if you think of Rodan, he didn't sculpt every single thing that he produced. He had a studio helping him. Is mm -hmm. there potential through the use of AI to allow an individual to mass and create and transport an audience to worlds that the physical hand could not generate in a lifetime the amount mm -hmm. of work that it's producing. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what will we get to have, whether it's produced for entertainment or education, the ability for someone who isn't necessarily creatively, physically creatively inclined to paint pictures that allow people to visit these theorems, these histories, these stories that otherwise would need money and a whole staff of humans to produce. It's a fascinating time to be thinking about where all this stuff is heading. And then on the learning front, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention memory palaces and the method of loci and the idea that our minds, our memories are stronger when connected to that sense of space and that sense of place that you were describing. That's one example. But I'd love it if we could nerd out briefly on any thoughts you might have around specific learning applications or, or anything you've wondered about in terms of making our educational experiences as rich and engaging as some of our entertainment experiences? I remember back in the early 80s, my wife and I, we both grew up in San Francisco. There was a local talk show and we actually got to be in the audience watching whoever guest showed up. And the person that showed up was a math savant. Mm who could just pull numbers, you know, any number you threw at her, she could add together. And they asked her how she was capable of doing that. And she said, well, actually, since my childhood, I've been surrounded by numbers. And those numbers have different colors and different temperatures. So mm -hmm. when you ask me something, I can see fives are red and they're over here floating in space over here. And they're, maybe they're cold, while 10 over here is hot, hot, hot. And I've thought about that ever since, especially in the design of theme parks, and in games and now in virtual worlds, our ability to apply emotion and meaning to abstract thoughts and ideas. So let's say a mind palace, let's say a mind palace initially is a big void of darkness or even, you know, it's a warm sunset light that's on you and you have an idea and you manifest it as a cube and you give it a color that has meaning to you. And then you place it in that environment based upon your relationship to its distance. Mm. Those are super abstract ideas. But since you're the one that's having the relationship, that this time of day makes you feel more creative and that this idea feels like a cube idea and it feels like it's a red color, how can we as designers utilize the human ability to think that abstractly to apply meaning to things in spaces. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do in theme parks and in video games is that if you create the rules of a universe, as long as you don't break it, our brains are willing to believe it. I think an example of that is if you go to a theater on Broadway and the curtains open and then the curtain closes and when it opens again, it says 10 years later, the audience goes, got it. We just go, okay, Yeah, yeah. I, I understand that. Oh, dream sequence. Well, what is the physical manifestation of that? Hmm. You know, is there a train station where each train takes you to a different time period? Mm -hmm. Are there portals that live in our pocket that when we pull it out, it will, you know, give us full access to every Shakespearean play right. live, right. you know? Do we choose whether to see through the eyes of the protagonist or from third person from the mm -hmm. outside of the protagonist. Mm -hmm. All the tools are available for us to do any of those things right now, whether it's in VR or on a computer screen or on our phone. I think it's just we're sort of waking up to the opportunity for us as creators to start utilizing them for educational purposes 
mm -hmm. not just entertainment purposes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And for our listeners, hopefully you're inspired by some of the conversation with Don Carson. Walkabout Mini Golf is the name of the game and Mighty Coconut is the name of the studio. We're getting closer to conclusion here. Don, I always like to give guests an opportunity for some closing remarks, some takeaways. We are also talking to folks who are in the world of learning. So if there's any particular closing remarks for folks who care about the future of learning as an expert in VR and games and all the wonderful stuff you've done at Disney, any closing comments as we wrap things up here? I'd just say be open-minded, be curious. I would say that if you haven't had an opportunity to check out VR, you know, seek it. Uh, know that it's not just games. I think one of the richest places to start feeling that out is on the Quest store within the Quest headsets, this called Quest TV, which there's a lot of experimentation happening in there, whether it's National Geographic's or it's illustrators or they're, they're animators, there's historians in there. And there's these little bite-sized sort of mini documentaries that are happening and view them not necessarily as oh, these are finished products that are telling me what the future is. These are all experiments that are trying to inform me of information that traditionally I might have seen on a plaque in a museum or I might have read in a book. I'm beginning to ask the question, what would it be like for me to be in this place or in this time or from this perspective, mm -hmm. whether I'm an atom or whether or not I'm sitting in the back of the bus? What are the opportunities for us as individual creators and storytellers and historians to utilize this new technology and embrace it to become the new way in which we communicate these designs to a new audience. Amazing stuff. Reminds me of the quote, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. You're someone who's been fortunate enough to do that. And hopefully we're inspiring some learning designers out there to lean in and make some new things. That's how you learn. That's how you invent. That's how we stay human. Don Carson, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Hopefully our listeners enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please subscribe, tell your friends, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.